Welcome to the Mike Knox Comedy Podcast. I am your host, Mike Knox. Welcome to episode number eight. I don't know what your lucky number is. My lucky number is number 15. Always has been, always will. I wanted to start out with the no sponsor. I don't have any sponsors, but if I did, I would sponsor Lexus, because I think that is a good car. I have a Lexus, yes, 350, and it has lasted, it's a 2008, and I have very minimal problems with that car, uh, not unlike the other cars that I've had in the past, and I wanted to talk about those cars. The first car that I had was a Volkswagen uh, Scirocco, it was kind of a orangish red color, and it was a good car until this lady smashed into me head on. Uh, I was going over to a uh, friend's house, and this lady crashed. She was turning left and went right into me head first, and she had a Mercedes station wagon. And I was thinking, oh, okay, cool. She's probably got insurance. Her kids got on a private school uniform. I should be okay. I was polite. You know, we exchanged numbers. The police came. Um, so everything was civil until I found out that uh, on that day, her husband had been indicted, I think, by the FBI uh, for insider trading, and he'd been arrested, and she just picked up her kid, and she was on her way home. Basically, she was frazzled, and so I had her address, and she wasn't answering any of my calls, and since I was young at the time, I went over to her house. It was this huge home in San Marino, and... Uh, you know, I knock on the door and nobody answers. The, her smashed Mercedes is in the driveway. I kind of looked over, could see through the window, uh, and there was no furniture in the house. Everything is, was gone. And I never heard from her ever again. And so uh, I figured, oh, I, I might as well take her to small claims. Small claims at the time was like $5,000. And, uh, uh, and her attorney called and, you know, said, good luck there, guy. You're the 151st person trying to sue this uh, this family. So I never never even showed up for court, and my insurance gave me 5000 And then I bought a used uh, 1984 BMW 318i, and I put like 140,000 miles on that car. No, I, I bought it with 108,000 miles, and then I ended up putting... I want to say 160 until it just finally like the muffler fell off one time and on the 101 in Santa Barbara I had to have my friend pick me up and we had to take the muffler and I took it in the shop and the guy would like was like this non-stop laughter he thought it was the most hilarious thing in the world that my muffler had fallen off of the car so then after that I got a Toyota truck which uh was a great truck until the um that broke down too and that was the radiator like cracked and but I think I drove that one oh and then I smashed into a I was on a job site and the sun was in my eyes and I smashed into like a cement pole that was there and never really got that fixed and I was hit twice in with that truck so I traded that truck in and then I got a Volvo and I think it was like a Volvo 60 I want to say and what I learned with the Volvo, no, before that, I take that back, I got a Audi uh, A4, a very nice, comfortable car, but uh, what I learned with the Audi was that it is very expensive to fix, and the first time I took it in to get it fixed, it was, the clutch went out, it was like two grand to fix, so everything was like three times more to fix, they like wouldn't even... They had some special keys, so Jiffy Lube wouldn't even change the oil in that car. It had to be, like, synthetic, and each oil change was, like, $150. And uh, I'm at work one time, and, and uh, the car won't turn over, and I go to pop the hood. I don't know what I'm doing. I just pop the hood. Maybe, you know, a miracle happened. And there is a pigeon that had crawled up underneath the car and gotten inside the belt and basically when I turned the car over the belt like strangled the pigeon to death and so when I took it in they're like oh yeah that's gonna be like five grand because see the pigeon blood got all over the sensors so the computer can't read itself and basically at that point I was like this car is like a lemon and I gotta get rid of it so then I traded that one in for a Volvo not even knowing and I'm thinking hey I'm part Swedish Volvo's kind of Swedish it's a comfortable car, and it was good-looking car. That in the Audi, but I, uh, 
again, the transmission went out and then I didn't have anybody to, nobody would touch the car. Uh, I guess there was some regulations at certain places. So I had to take that thing like 30 miles away to get fixed. And I couldn't, I think it was like three grand to fix that. And uh, what I realized was I need to get a car that uh, has a local uh, mechanic. So then I got a Jeep and that Jeep had an oil leak that they could never take it in. They'd be like, it's all fixed. And then it'd be leaking oil. So it constantly leaked oil. And this was at a time where I was like completely broke. So, and the air conditioning would not get any cooler than 70. If you put it any over 70, it would like completely overheat and shut off. And where I live is very hot. So it was horrible. And like, the tread was showing on one of the tires. So I put duct tape over it. Cause I was like, at that time that was like my Dave Ramsey car where I was just trying to, I was trying to get out of debt and, uh, solve my life problems. And, uh, I didn't want to finance a car and that, that Jeep was very comfortable, but it had a horrible engine. And I realized that is the reason why it was the only Jeep on that lot when I got it. But, uh, I, uh, Still to this day, I liked that car, but I ended up getting rid of that car, and I traded that one in, and I got a Honda Accord, and never had any problems with the Honda Accord, except that I think after like 10 years, the Honda, like the paint just starts to chip away, something uh, like that. So after that, I got a Toyota Camry, another great car. But after a few years, the dash starts to have like this stickiness to it from the sun. And, the, you know, it's basically this whole thing with insurance doesn't want to do anything about it. <clears throat> they would have to replace, replace the entire dash. So then after that, I traded that in and I got the Lexus, which was a 2008. And I've had no problems with that. Um, so that is my car story. And that's why I, I'm fearful of getting another car. I don't want to, uh, and especially I think... I know cars have jumped like five grand because was, I was looking at cars like a year ago and now everything's way too expensive. I try to keep it, try to keep my cars under 20,000. And um, I know that they're willing to give you any car uh, that they, the dealer will give you any car possible because they do not care. They just want you to finance that car. So they'll be like $80,000 for a car. Yeah, no problem, buddy. So the LA haunt for the day is Devonshire Downs. And what I like about Devonshire Downs is it's on the north part of CSUN, Cal State Northridge, which is where I went to college. It was after the, I went there after the Northridge earthquake. So it was like me and like a guy with three heads. And that was it. The can't, the, like the, there was classrooms in, uh, in uh, tents and like the main building where they used to have a subway up on the roof was like completely like condemned and, uh, so I would go over to Devonshire Downs, and the reason I would go there is because I knew that they filmed the the Jerk, and uh, and it was the carnival scene in the Jerk, uh, with Steve Martin and uh, the detectives following the private investigators following around, and uh, so I went up there, and uh, it also used to be a football field, uh, but they tore that down in two thousand and one and put up an industrial park. Prior to that, though, when it was Devonshire Downs, Devonshire Downs was a horse track. And they had horse races right there in Northridge, and it closed in 1971. And uh, then that is where they had the New York Newport Pop Festival in 1969. Jimi Hendrix played right there, man, and they don't even have a plaque for him. And that was like 1969 was with, with everybody with all the hippies and the baby boomers loving it up. So that is a historical spot right there. Devonshire Downs, the Downs. That is a piece of valley history right there. And to my knowledge, they do not have a plaque there, but they should definitely have one. I wish they had a plaque there for The Jerk because that was just a great, great movie. Especially the carnival scene was so great. Places to eat in Los Angeles. I would definitely check out Cantor's Deli at 419 North Fairfax in Hollywood. You know, I've been there quite a few times. You always see a celebrity there. So if you like seeing celebrities, I always see somebody there. Get yourself a pastrami sandwich and some side of pickles. I uh, Pastrami, you know, sometimes 
doesn't sit right with me. Uh, so I usually go with the uh, roast beef. Uh, but it's just Cantor's is, it's got a huge sign. It's been there a gazillion years. So it's just got a really cool retro sign. It's got a bakery in there. Uh, it's just got an old feel of Hollywood. And that is why I suggest going into Cantor's Deli. And also, I think Cantor's uh, used to be open 24 hours a day. I don't know if they still are because of COVID, but I mean, you could go and get yourself a sandwich at one o'clock in the morning and nobody would even look at you strange. A, another place to go is Valley Relics. That is a museum that is all about the San Fernando Valley. Uh, 7900 Balboa Boulevard in Van Nuys. What you want to do is when you're on Balboa, you actually want to uh, go around to the backside of that. It's actually butts up against the Van Nuys airport but uh all the nostalgia that you need is in Valley Relics I've actually donated some lunch boxes I used to have a lunch box collection I donated it there because I really didn't have room and I also donated two uh BMX Torkers Torker was my bicycle back in the day it actually got stolen from me in the sixth grade I want to say I had it in the backyard and somebody came in the backyard in the middle of the night and jacked it but uh, the uh, Torker 280, I believe, and um, you know, I had those two bikes, and I was like, "Yeah, just too, I'm too, bu- I'm too large of a person to be riding those bicycles around." So uh, I decided to donate it to Valley Relics because they have a, uh, they got arcade games in there, they got a bunch of signs from everywhere in the valley. It's basically because if you don't know, the San Fernando Valley is like this forgotten spot, and for many years it was always like. Uh, you know, if you watch Valley Girl, it's like, you're from the valley, you're not from the valley. And it was always this kind of, the valley was like the forgotten place. But uh, it's got a lot of history, and all that history has been collected, and it is at the Valley Relics Museum. Definitely want to check that place out. And uh, I just bought a Malibu Grand Prix uh, jacket. Malibu Grand Prix was uh, the go-kart track back in the day. And, uh, you know, I always wanted to go there. They had one in Pasadena and then you had, I think you had to be 14. And by the time I turned 14, they like ripped up the track and replaced it with like a strip joint or something. But, uh, I, we'd see it off the freeway and I'd be dreaming about when I turn 14, man, they're going to give me that Malibu Grand Prix license and I'm going to go drive there. And it never, never came about. I did go to the arcade there many times. Uh, and I, I would dream about the day that, uh, I could go there. So, uh. In these strange neighbors, uh, I'm running out of strange neighbors, but there is this guy that appeared, uh, and I think, I think if you don't have anything planned in your life, like when you get old and you retire, and that retirement day comes up, you have your retirement party, whatever, and then you're 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 at home for a while in your underwear and you're watching TV, and then you're getting bored and you're trying to find something to do, and you realize that you're just have your your job has been your life. So you don't know what to do. And I think that those old people then step out into the neighborhood, which is a safe place. Um, You know, they've saved their entire life. Maybe their house is paid off. But it's usually a guy and he's wearing some slacks. And now he's become the uh, miles per hour police. And he likes to stand there on the corner and wave you down. And it's an angry wave. It's not like a, hey, how you doing? Have a nice morning. It's like, you're going way too fast. Slow down. And my question here is, how do you know, old man, when you can't even see or hear, and you're thinking that I'm going 55 miles an hour on a residential street, and I'm going five miles an hour. I just I just pulled out of my driveway i can't be going it's it's physically impossible albert einstein will tell you this for me to go 55 miles an hour just backing out of my driveway just doing that little l-shaped turn there it's impossible okay so you need to find something else to do and i think that's why we have golf courses because golf is the end all to when you didn't plan for anything you don't have any hobbies you might have a friend, but if you don't have any friends, they're going to they're gonna pair you up with somebody there at the golf course because we do not need you on our street. You serve no purpose. If you call the police, the police are just going to hang up on you. If there's no crime has been committed. So that is a category of suburbia that uh, needs to change because you're under the perception that nothing's going to happen to you. Believe me, something nowadays in 2022, 
somebody else is going to snap because you looked at them weird. That's the reality of the society that we live in now. It's not going to be me. I'm a peaceful person. But somebody else is going to be mad at you, the guy in the trousers that's screaming at you to slow down when you're not even doing anything. So just, I want you to think about that. We're going to name you uh, Stanley. So Stanley, think about your actions. You're at the end of life. So uh, the book of the week is uh, Cannery Row by John Steinbeck. Now, what I like about John Steinbeck is that um, he basically, to me, was uh, drinking a lot and knew some people that drank a lot and really crafted his books around an environment of people that were drinkers. So that's why I love all his books. And Cannery Row, up in Monterey, it's not there anymore. Nobody's canning anything anymore. Uh, I mean, they are, but we're probably getting all of our fish from, like, China. So we don't have, like, a canning industry like we used to have in Monterey. We used to have one in San Francisco. We had another one in San Pedro. They're gone. That's it. But this man has written books about canning, and they are amazing, very nostalgic for the area. He also has a museum up there in Sal I think it's in Sausalito, where he was from. But uh, he is a wordsmith, uh, just a great American writer, you know, from California. I believe he was from California. Uh, so definitely read that book if you haven't. Uh, and I will definitely mention some more of his books because I've always liked him. My man cave purchase of this week was uh, from the Disney movie Black Hole. I'm not, per se, a Disney fan. Uh, I do like that Disney's incorporated, you know, the Millennium Falcon uh, and some Star Wars stuff. But I always did love the movie The Black Hole, which is basically about this crazy dude that has turned his entire crew into, like, robots. And then, like, another rescue crew comes to get him. And he's like, no, I'm fine. I'm going to go through this black hole here in space. And uh, it was kind of like the competitor i would say with star wars maybe disney was like hey we got to make this star sort of you know space movie and uh then they had these cool like they had a basically like an r2d2 but he he was levitating you know uh so he was like a drone i think his name was bob he was either bob or vincent i can't remember but there was that guy he basically looked like a trash can with a hat on and then the other guy was like this looked like this like evil red dude and uh that's why I'm saying I'm not that big of a Disney fan. I don't, uh, I just saw them and I was like, those are the figures that I need for my bookshelf. And so I'll definitely post a photo of those guys and I will, sorry for the diehard, uh, black hole fans. I got I haven't seen the movie in many years, but I probably got their name uh, wrong. I, I do think one was like a acronym for Bob. Uh, I don't know. We're gonna have to argue about that, but, uh, Next on our list is government operations, uh, and definitely check out Operation Vigilant Guardian. Now, I'm not a 9-11 fanatic, but on 9-11, the same time, uh, September 11th, 2001, the military was also doing a simulation of hijacked airplanes. Um, so you actually had that simulation going on, and then you had the real hijacked planes going on at the same time coincidence that is for the conspiracy theorists but um definitely interesting reading and so i want you to you know take more of a dive into that i want to move on to my uh childhood memories i don't know if i discussed this but uh because i'm adopted i think that my parents felt uh they didn't really need to pay attention to my sister and i she was also adopted and so early on like when we were asking about our uh birthdays did I discuss this Applejack before? Well, I'm going to talk about it again. So they would get my sister inside. My sister's birthday's in February, mine's in May, but they'd get them confused. Like they'd say, oh, no, you're in February. Oh, no, your sister's in May. So then when Mrs. Manley, my first, our first grade teacher, uh, you know, said, hey, why don't you kids write that down on the board? So then I went home and I'm like, well, when is my birthday? And then my mom was like, well, why don't we discuss this? And me being the age of six or seven, I didn't think that that was a red flag of parenting. I just thought, oh, every other kid discusses when your birthday is. So my mom discussed with somebody, probably my dad, uh, and they came up with your birthday is on uh, May 14th. So I went to school and I told them that my birthday was on May 14th. And then when May 14th rolled around, I went to school and everybody was like, ah, ah 
yay, yay, happy birthday, Michael, yay, it's your birthday, you know, everybody's woo, everybody's clapping, um, yay, <laughs> children clapping, and uh, then I had to explain, hey, settle down, uh, it's not my birthday, it is a, uh, not my birthday at all, uh, it's on the 16th, but then there was another kid that had a birthday too, and his name was Michael. So we had double birthday parties for like the next four years. And then, fascinating enough, that same guy, uh, I saw him years later. Um, we ended up going to City College together, I do believe. And then I actually saw him with his kids at the same school that my kid was going to. Craziness. Crazy. The, the numbers line up. That's how crazy it is. So in the quote by uh, Jordan Peele, because this guy has worked very hard, uh, and he says, I stopped writing Get Out about 20 times because I thought it was impossible. I thought no one would ever make this movie, but I kept coming back to it because I knew if someone let me make this movie, people would hear it and people would see it. And that is what you want to do with writing is you want to be persistent, uh, no matter what it is, what script or a book or whatever it is, just write that sucker out and, and get it out there and get it done. And then someday you might be able to get it, you know, get that movie done or get that that uh, that book published. But uh, it's better to have it uh, already written. So just in case you get that day. And analog clocks because kids cannot read them. So I don't know if schools still have them, but they used to be these. Every school was like the same. I guess they got it from the same clockmaker, but it'd be with this like silver clock and it looked like it was military style. Uh, but, uh, you know, it'd have the uh, short hand, hand and the long or the short arm and the long arm. And uh, this is the only thing that k made me pay attention in school was waiting for that long arm to hit that 12. Then that means that class is over with and you can move on to the next day. I wasn't looking at anything else except for that clock. So if anything, they should leave those clocks in so that kids like me can at least graduate. Also in the news, a, uh, a woman in Ohio uh, sent in her DNA. I also sent my DNA and it said that I was uh, mostly Irish. And uh, actually my adoption paper said that I was Swedish, so it was, it was wrong. I don't know who to believe anymore, the DNA or the Los Angeles County adoption people. But uh, the uh, DNA kit came back, and basically what happened was that, that when her mother went to uh, do some, I don't know, doctor stuff with the egg, uh, somebody did the old switcheroo there, uh, and uh, that's another reason. And then she found out that her father uh, was not her father, which you know what, the guy raised you your entire life. Um, so yes, you can sue and you can get millions of dollars, but just tell that guy you love him. I mean, he did the best that he could. But that brings me to, like, when I was in college, they would always have, uh, like, the uh, newspaper, the school paper would always be, donate your 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 manliness to this lab for $50. And I was just always too embarrassed myself. Uh, I would have loved the money. But, uh, you know, really the incentive of $50, I would have done it more for $100. But I was just so, so embarrassed that I would never do that. But I'm glad that I never did do that. Uh, because now you've got all these people that want to sue the places and sue the people. And then you find out that, that, uh, yeah, all these people showed up to donate, but it was really just the on-call doctor there that donated all 5,000 specimens, you know, and then now he's got 20,000 kids. Also in the news, the U S army will be discharging, uh, all the vaccine. Uh, I like how they called it the, they call them the refuse Nicks, like they're beat Nicks, but they're refusing. Uh, there are, 3,300 soldiers, about 3% that uh, are not vaxxed. And all I've got to say here is whatever side that you're on, uh, this is a great way to get out of the army. Like you've signed up. I I'm sure that there's like, there's people just don't discuss it. But like, I remember the, the recruiter called me 
at like six o'clock on a Saturday and I'm like all hung over and I'm freaking out that this like sergeant from the military called me and he's like, what do you want to do? And so I'm just like, I, I guess I want to jump out of airplanes. And he's like, great, we're going to sign you up. And my mom gets on the phone and she's like, you stop calling Michael. He needs his sleep. And then the sergeant was like, we get up at 4 a.m., man. No, Michael needs to sleep in. And I, that's the only one of the few times I agreed with my mom. Because at that time, I was sleeping in until like 3 in the afternoon. That That's really when you're getting your best sleep for a lot of people is those teen years. Because I've never gotten sleep ever since then. I think as you start getting older, you're sleeping less. Uh, and I think it's because you know the truth out there of society. And so that keeps you up at night. Something keeps you up. And there's nothing that uh, can do away with uh, insomnia. And there are a lot of people that know what I'm talking about when they have insomnia. But... I think it's a great way for people who, you know, maybe you went through boot camp and you didn't get stationed where you wanted to get stationed or you met somebody, you know, I think a lot of people will probably sign up and then they meet somebody right before and they don't, now they don't want to go because they're in love with somebody. Just so many different variations. I think we don't talk about those that, um, that's probably, I bet, I bet a good amount of those, uh, 3000 are like, Hey, great. This is a great way for me to get out of it. Uh, I'm not just, I'm not quite sure what they, if they give you a, hopefully they give you an honorable discharge though. That would be, that would be nice. Also in the news, this is LA news. The, uh, this is from Porter Ranch and they have a park there that's called ET park. And that is because most, uh, I would say a lot of, uh, ET was shot in the, in the Valley area. Um, and actually, uh, Elliot's home is over, uh, off the 210, and uh i'll actually have to get that address but like the housing track was you know pretty much like porter ranch had just been developed at the time there's parks and then he's he's going down the he's riding his bike down the tree line street in granada hills so the uh et park wants to put up a uh uh a name change for uh porter ridge park and so now into addition, this is somebody saying, yeah, that's a great idea because, you know, we have uh, racing, cars doing donuts, fireworks, people having sex, you know, drinking alcohol, sex, drugs, rock and roll, loud music and trash. Now we can have more and more people coming here to see where E.T. flew across the sky on his bike. And uh, I've got to say that because I like to go to those places uh, and see where movies were filmed, and I would like little plaques there. Like they have a plaque where the uh, the uh, Goonies was filmed. And I'm all for that. I mean, we have all these strange signs around L.A. anyways for parking. Why not put up some signs for where movies were filmed? A uh, Another thing that I was thinking about when I was talking the other day about uh, the gas uh, being, instead of electric, they would funnel in uh, natural gas to light uh, homes and also light the streets. Uh, I was always thinking, how did people wake up if they didn't have a chicken and the, or a rooster and the rooster would crow? But what if they, you know, because a rooster is going to crow at sunrise, right? So what if you want to wake up later or before that? And so I was looking stuff up and they actually had, this is, this is mind blowing to me. But when there were no clocks, um, they would actually use candles and then they would say they had a long candle, like a foot long, and they would uh, etch it with, with basically the candle's going to burn an hour. And so say you'd have like 12 hours in that candle. So they would make a mark and they would use a nail, right? So say they want to wake up, uh, at six o'clock. Well, that candle is then going to burn down to the nail. The nail is going to fall and hit the, uh, like the tin holder and it's going to make a noise and that's going to wake you up. Uh, you could put another one in there for, you know, if you wanted to, um, sleep in later, like your snooze button. That's another nail. So, um, very fascinating that that was the way that many different variations of using a candle to, as your alarm clock. Um, so we've always been in innovative people is what I want to say. Also, I was reading today that, uh, they have found Captain James Cook's ship, the, uh, Endeavor. It's actually been at the bottom of the sea for 250 years. It was, uh, uh, he reached uh, Australia, and that's when they uh, scuttled the ship. And uh, so I think it would be interesting to raise that ship. Uh, and I think that uh, Captain Cook is uh, very notorious 
traveler. And so it would be cool if they could get that uh, ship up and uh, have a museum out of it. I was watching this other show where they had a museum of a river boat in Missouri, I think, where it's actually they turn they raised it and then they turned the entire like you're inside of it, like the gift shop is like the you're actually inside this uh, river boat, which to me is pretty um, that's pretty fascinating to me that they can do that and reconstruct it because I can't put together a bookshelf from Ikea. That's how hard it is for me. This episode, and that is going to be Vicki Morgan. Now, Vicki Morgan is, I would say, a tragic tale of Hollywood uh, greed and money. And she was uh, born in 1952. She died in 1983. She was the mistress of Alfred Bloomingdale. Uh, Bloomingdale's, of course, is the uh, department store. I don't even know if Bloomingdale's... I don't think there's any in California. I know they were here for a while. But uh, then again, I don't go to a lot of department stores, so I'm not too sure. Very famous Bloomingdale's department store, though. And um, so she uh, met him and... uh, she was already married at the time. She was from Colorado Springs, Colorado. That's where my sister went to college, and uh, it's kind of an interesting town. It's like small town feel. Everybody tells you to go hike at Pikes Peak, and then I read one time that it was like the murder capital of the world. I can't verify that, but uh, that was the feeling that I was getting when I was walking around there. Anyways, don't worry, my sister survived that. But uh, her mother was, uh, uh, her father was a United States Air Force veteran. They do have an Air Force base there in Colorado Springs. They divorced soon after Vicky was born, and then her mother remarried. Uh, but that husband died when uh, Vicky was nine years old. Uh, then her mother moved to Montclair, California. Again, Montclair, uh, I think is off the 210, isn't it? But a nice little sleepy little town. Is not clear off the 210? I can't remember. Don't quote me on that one. Uh, she attended Chafee High School, and uh, then she uh, dropped out and uh, had a son, and uh, actually left her son with her mother and ran away from home in 1968. And, uh, you know, 1968 was a time when you were putting flowers in your hair, going to San Francisco. Manson was going up and down the uh, coast there. You're getting caught up. You're dropping headband- You're putting headbands on, listening to the Beatles album. She uh, found work at uh, as an usher at Groman's Chinese Theater, which uh, right there in Hollywood, I've never been there before, but that's where all the celebrities have put their uh, handprints and signatures in the cement out in front, and it's definitely a tourist destination. It's just always so crowded, and every time I go there, uh, there's always somebody like hawking their, uh, their, uh, you know, their rap album or whatever on the CD, uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't know, I don't, don't want to take my chances of listening to an album that that uh that I haven't first listened to on Spotify. So she uh she's working at the Usher and uh she soon marries uh a 40 47-year-old guy named Earl Lamb. So she's like you very young and she meets this 47-year-old guy. That is a Hollywood love story right there. In 69, still 17, she meets uh Alfred Bloomingdale and uh he is married, he's a multimillionaire, and he's from the, of course, famous uh, department store. It's a restaurant on the Sunset Strip. I'm not quite too sure which restaurant that it was. Sunset Strip, by the way, has changed a lot. Uh, there's been a lot of building there. It is not the sleepy town that we all think that it used to be. So he took Morgan as his mistress, basically told her, like, how much is it going to cost for you to leave your husband? And... Uh, she was like late and she took off and with Bloomingdale and uh you know he liked to get the ladies there and he liked to get some beat downs uh he was a bit of a kinky guy um so she's 18 he's 54 something like that um he also offered the uh ex-husband a large uh cash of money to end that marriage and I guess apparently he did he set her up in an apartment and uh it wasn't until the uh, wife found out that she was mad about that, but basically, in a nutshell, she uh, she was uh, offered to be taken care of for the rest of her life by Bloomingdale, and then the wife did not approve of that, and she wanted everything to be cut off, which was one of the things. So, when he broke off the relationship with her, you know, she thought she was going to get all this money, and then she sued him, and he basically, you know, by the way, it's the seventies in California, so I think she would have won the case now. 
uh, but back then, no chance. So she's living in an apartment in Studio City. The apartment's still there. She's got a roommate in there. She's kind of going through some problems. Um, by 1979, she's been through two more marriages, uh, long periods of sex work, uh, and has a big uh, drug addiction. Uh, she was in and out of uh, rehab. She just finished a rehabilitation uh, rehab where she met uh, Marvin uh, Pancoast, a, a man who seemed to be infatuated with her. They moved in together. Um, they uh, vowed to live together once they were released from uh, their uh, treatment center. So uh, kind of like, you know, this addiction, uh, and then you're, you know, that's why they say in addiction you shouldn't have a relationship. She wasn't having a relationship with this guy, but he was just infatuated with her. She's this beautiful lady. She's attached to this very wealthy guy. He's maybe thinking there's some money in it for him, maybe. Um, he told Morgan that he had only uh, two months to live and that he assured her that she would be well taken care of. Um, uh, Bloomingdale said that, sorry, <clears throat> says he's only got, um, two months to live. And as he's dying, you know, he wants to get that relationship back together and he promises her all this money. So that's why she sues. But during that time, um, her roommate that was infatuated with her ends up murdering her in their, uh, apartment in studio city. And, uh, I don't know, it's a little shady. You could kind of, uh, and I don't know where that guy is anymore. I can't really find out if he was in prison or not. That happened in 83. Uh, it was 11 months after Bloomingdale's death, and uh, Pancos walks into the police station and confesses to murdering Morgan in her apartment. I've, I've uh, filmed that apartment, too, on my YouTube channel. Uh, I should definitely go back there again. I went to the grave of, of Vicki Morgan. Uh, I should also say, a very beautiful woman. She could have had a good uh, career in uh, modeling. Uh, she is, she is an unmarked grave, but she is buried at Forest Lawn, in Hollywood Hills, in uh, uh, the very first columbrium as you walk in, uh, and it's on the right hand side, but it's unmarked, so I don't know which one that it is, and there's a couple hundred of them in there, and so hopefully someday somebody can find which one it was. I don't know; it should be marked again. The city should have something where these graves. That are unmarked, get marked. Because she's definitely one of those stories about Hollywood, you know, the dark side of Hollywood. Um, her killer got 26 years to life. Oh, there we go. He got 26 years to life and died in Chino Prison in uh, 1991 uh, of AIDS. Uh, so just an all around sad and uh, disturbing story. Her palimony suit against him and his estate. Uh, continued on the behalf of her son. Uh, she had referred to a contract in which Bloomingdale had given her, uh, which said that he was going to give her $240,000. Uh, she was given $40,000. During that trial, the judge ruled that the agreement was unenforceable as it was for illegal acts. <laughs> Again, I don't think uh, I don't think it would really matter now. I think she would probably get some money. But there was uh, actually a... Um, uh, there's a book, Dominic Dunn actually did a uh, show about her called, uh, or he wrote a book about her, uh, An Inconvenient Woman, the story of her life and death, uh, was also the topic of uh, Vanity Fair Confidential, which is a pretty good show that Dominic Dunn, uh, definitely check that out, but it's basically all of the uh, celebrity crimes, pretty much, or what happens in Hollywood. Uh, you kind of always think of Los Angeles uh, it really is a kind of a two-sided place. There's the very extremely wealthy here and the extremely poor all kind of living together. Anyways, like, subscribe, tell me who else you want me to see. Uh, definitely tell me what grave you want me to and check out uh, my famous graves on TikTok. Uh, 